If you got your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be there in just a moment as we continue our series that we started last week. But I want to just make a couple of, uh, of announcements real quick that I forgot. Um, I want to get out of the way before we jump into the message. If you look in your bulletins, there should be an insert. On one side, it should say baptism, and on the other side, it should say community group. And you'll notice there's a QR code on both of those. And so if you don't know what a QR code is and you want to do either of these things, then you need to go to the welcome desk. They will help you. Um, if you do know what a QR code is, we're, we're getting ready to, to do a baptism service here in October. And so we just wanted to throw out to say, if you've been thinking about getting baptized, we want you to scan that QR code, fill out the info, and we'll contact you. Um, here at Grace, we do not believe that baptism is necessary for salvation but we do believe that baptism is the outward profession of what happened on the inside and it is a necessary first step for discipleship. If we're going to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus, then it has to start with the simple things. And Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them, right? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded. So if you've never been baptized, we would love to talk to you about that. But can you make QR code and fill that out? It, it's not like a committal. You know, we're not going to take your firstborn. Um, but we would love to have a conversation with you about that. So if you've never been baptized, fill that out. The deadline for that is in, it, we have two two more weeks before we kind of want to wrap it up to have time for conversations. Two more Sundays after today, excuse me. And the second thing is today is kind of community group kickoff. And we are, here at Grace, community groups are important to us. You've probably heard me say it, and you'll hear me say it. You were not meant to live the Christian life alone. The biggest lie of the enemy and the biggest lie of our culture is you don't need other people. And here's the reality. If you are not living life with other Christians who are walking with Christ, you are probably struggling. I'm just going to say it that boldly. You're probably wondering, like the Philippians were, as we talked last week, do I keep doing this thing? We believe that community is important. So on the flip side, whichever side you open first, there's another QR code to sign up for community groups. So just so you know, we have community groups. We have a, a one men's only group and one women's only group that meet on Mondays and Wednesdays. We have joint, I don't know what the right word is here, family community group. Thank you. Um, if you don't have a family and you're single, we'll put all you guys together and maybe we start a family. Anybody? Look, y'all, look, I, got a, I, got, I got a signing bonus to decide to how many people we get in community group. I'm just kidding. That's, that's not true. That's not true. Your family community groups, as in the whole family, whether you're single or whether you have a family, that meet Monday nights, Wednesday nights, Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Sunday afternoons. So, if you are not plugged in, fill that out, and you want to, we'd love to get you connected. If any questions can see me, those are just a few logistics I want to get out of the way so we jump into our message. Right. So actually, we started a new series in the book of Philippians, and this is our title for the series, Joyful Living in the Midst of Uncertainty. And so if you want to know any of the background in- intro or info, why, we, why we're going through this, it's all last week. Um, in the last week's sermon, you can find it on graceroxford.com, and soon you'll be able to find it on our app. Like, you might want to come to church next week, okay, if you want to know about the app and what's going on. Right, I'm just going to drop the bomb. Um, coming. Ready. So good. Do not go try to find it before next Sunday. I'm going to be in big trouble. Okay? Just come next Sunday and we'll talk about it. All right. You can find that sermon. Last week, we were talking about being called to be different. But the basis for joyful living in the midst of uncertainty is recognizing, is being aware of, and embracing the fact that we've been called to be different. You are not, we are not different because we're here. That may make us different from some people who are getting still getting good sleep ready for the lions today, not till four o'clock, right? But um, we're still sleeping off the terrible interception. If you're starting to anyway, anyway, I'm so thankful we're here to worship Jesus, but. 
We're not just different because we're here. We're different because we're in Christ. And so we, we kind of covered that last week. But now we're going to begin working through the book of Philippians. And remember, the context of this book is written to believers. So the, 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 the tone of these messages is going to be aimed right at those of us in this room who put their faith in Jesus on how do we live different. How do we live joyful in the midst of, of uncertainty? But since we've been called to be different, as Paul writes to this church and tells them, here's the ways you should be doing that. That's what we're gonna. That's what we're gonna kind of nail down. So for the next seven, eight weeks, I keep. I don't remember how many. I probably should have worked that up this week. But we're just gonna be journeying through how do we live joyful lives in the midst of uncertainty. We'll be talking about the gospel, but that's what sets us apart. And now, how do we live that out? So today. The title of our message is called An Indispensable Practice. Prayer. An Indispensable Practice. There's some things that we need to be reminded of and some things that we need to be called to do if we're going to live joyful lives in the midst of uncertainty. And it doesn't surprise me that the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians starts with prayer. What's interesting, though, is he doesn't command them to pray. He will later in chapter 4. We'll come back to this. But he actually just expresses to them who he is and what he's doing. Now remember, he's in jail, right? He's in prison, most likely in Rome. You, you can disagree if, if, if you think he's in Ephesus or Caesarea. I'm not going to argue about that, but he's in prison. Got a lot of things going on, but he wants to make sure the Philippian believers know. And for you every day. And so, as we jump into Philippians chapter 1, I think we can learn a little bit about maybe the posture we should pray, maybe some of the things we should say as we look at Paul's prayer. Um, but there's probably nothing more agreed upon in this room by those who are in Christ, who are, who are followers of Jesus, that we should pray. Right? Everyone in agreement with that? So, the next question I'd like to raise how many of you are like, your prayer game is like Shohei Otani's game this week, like the, the perfect game, the greatest game, and you're like, oh, we don't watch baseball. I know, it's an old man's sport, but how many of you would say, let me rephrase this, how many of you would say, I'm nailing it in my prayer game? I love prayer. Like, I, go, I do it. It fills me up. It's so easy. I always know what to pray for. Actually, Kevin, I, like, I'm so faithful in praying that I just run out of hours in a day to talk to the Lord. I wish you would have made 26 hours. Right? What I'm going to bet is that most of us, while we would agree prayer is an indispensable practice, we struggle with it. I struggle with it. I struggle with, with communicating with someone I can't see and touch and feel. I struggle with knowing what to say. Right? I struggle with, to be honest, some of my biggest struggle in prayer is I know the wickedness of my own heart. I don't even know if I know how to ask the right thing. Early on, I thought I knew everything. The older I get, the more I realize I know nothing. You're welcome. Right? Some of you are like, finally, we've been praying for that. But prayer, it is, it, it, just because it's hard doesn't mean we should throw it out. It is actually an indispensable practice, and it doesn't surprise me that Paul starts with this, and later he'll come back to it, because the life of a joyful person in the midst of uncertainty is a life filled with the practice of prayer. And I want to say it that way on purpose, because it is a practice. It is a discipline. <laughs> I don't know about you, I've been married almost 24 years. Communication is still work, right? It is way easier to sit on the couch, turn on the game, and before I hit play, because we live in a digital world where we don't watch commercials anymore, which is amazing, I just look over my eyes and say, you good? And then she goes, I'm good. You good? Yeah. Boom. And then we spend the next three hours not even interacting with each other. Listen, some people crochet. I watch the ball. It's okay. And then you, before long, you're like, man, we don't have a talk. We're together all the time. But we, like, communication's really, you got to work at it, right? So, 
don't know about you, it's not getting any easier to work at it in marriage after 24 years, so I'm just going to assume that probably the next 24 is going to be just as hard, if not harder, because you now you want to know what happens? One of us speaks, and the other person genuinely doesn't hear. Huh? Like, I'm not joking. Like, I wish someone would have warned me about those subwoofers in my car as a teenager. <laughs> just kidding. Every old person in church warned me. I just didn't listen, right? But literally, like, I, I will have conversations. I'll look and say, did you hear me? She's like, you were talking? What? We do this. Like, so it's just getting harder. So let me just, from the beginning, let's just say, this view of prayer, as we pursue this in, in being followers of Christ who live joyful lives in the midst of a culture that is chaotic and uncertain, it is going to be worse. And I'm just going to warn you, actually, for the rest of this series, if you're not ready to put in the work to follow Jesus, you're going to be disappointed. It's going to be worse. Just like anything that's worth it, it's going to be worse. And so, it is an indispensable practice, but there's a couple things that we read here that I think will help, and so I want to encourage us today and give us some, some action steps as we head out of here. But join with me, Philippians 1, I'm going to read chapter, th- or chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, and actually, if you've been reading through the Bible Journal this week and you realize we skipped like a whole section of Acts, that's just because I'm not perfect yet. And I totally forgot to put it in there. So you can still read it. But man, that's because it's not like those verses. So those are actually some of the super important verses in Acts that, 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 I, that I missed. And it's okay. I'm only human. Maybe the next chapter will be perfect. We're going to have to wait about 40 years before you get a different one. So that's not true. I didn't know that makes it to 84. But. Yeah, I got that. All right. Come on, Tony. Move on. I thank my God, Paul says, every time I remember you. In all my prayers, for all of you. Now, we believe here at Grace that all scripture is inspired by God, right? Every word. It's not just random words. Every time. All my prayers for all of you. Paul is the guy who the reason he can be joyful in the midst of uncertainty, as we know he's in the last few years of his life, is because he's praying. I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from this time, or from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So he, he's explaining here his posture in prayer. We'll come back to it. It is right for me to feel this way about you, he says, since I have you in my heart. Translation, I heart you. Now you can just fix the call doing this, right? I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, he says. So he's just got done expa- explaining how he prays, his posture. This is my prayer. Here's what he prays. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Friends, don't miss this. As we try to live joyful lives in the midst of uncertainty, we press on towards a day that we know is going to happen. The day of Christ. He's coming back. I love this. He's like, I'm praying that you would just be pure and blameless. Like, let's not forget that we serve a God who's coming back. Just may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise. Of God. Some of you are like, hey, those verses sound familiar. If you've been doing the memory verses in the Abide Journal, those, that chunk is what we're memorizing. Oh, that makes more sense. Yeah. We do put some thought into it. An indispensable practice of prayer. Let's look at a couple of things that I want to pull from this text that can encourage us. 
again, if we're not careful, we just read over introductory. Oh, it's great. Paul prays for him. Whew, great. He's, he's an apostle. He's supposed to pray. No. I think he gives us some clues in what he says about both his posture in prayer, which I think makes praying much easier. And then the content of his prayers and the purpose of his prayers. Let's look at the first part, the basis for his prayer or the posture for his prayer. We see this in verses 3 through 8. Thanksgiving, thankfulness, confidence, compassion. We'll, we'll get to these points. Don't go to classroom. But I want to propose from the beginning. I think the struggle in my prayer life, let me just talk to me for a second, isn't so much how to pray. It's that I have a terrible prayer posture. Meaning, I don't come to the Lord in the right posture all the time. Right? Because I, it, I'm, it's chaotic, it's frustrating, like I'm a human. So I want us to get this. I think the key to the Apostle Paul's prayer isn't so much of what he says. We're going to talk about that, and there's a great outline for prayer here. But the basis for his prayer, or the posture of his prayer, I think is what leads to a joyful life in the midst of uncertainty. Number one, posture, thankfulness. Verses 3 through 5. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. Now, we could probably say, yeah, I can understand him being thankful for some of them. Right? Have we been in church for a while? I feel thankful for most of the people in our community, but there's always that few people. You're like, I don't know any of them. You're probably them. That was a joke. I'm sorry. Some of you thought that was funny. Some of you were mad now. But he says, this is the, the posture of my heart when I pray. I thank God every time I remember you in every prayer for all of you. But what is he thankful for? Because he's not just thankful for them as people. He's actually thankful, what it says here, verses 3, 4, and 5, for their partnership in the gospel. Literally, the Greek word is koinonia, if you've ever seen that word before. Um, we'll read about it in Acts chapter 2. We did read about it in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It, it, it's literally the word fellowship. It's literally the word um, um, intimate fellowship. He says, I, I'm thankful for you all the time. The fact that we have this intimate spiritual bond. In what? The gospel. I don't believe he, we'll see here in chapter 4 that these people sent him a lot of money over the, over the, er, not a lot of money, sent him money multiple times. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I don't think he's saying, I'm so thankful you've given me money. I believe what he's saying is I'm thankful for the koinonia, the, the, the community that we have in the gospel. The fact that you are in Christ, I am in Christ, everything we talked about last week, and we have this, we've been called out of the dead from an empty way of life into a new way of life, and we share that together. Here's what we know about the church in Philippi. We know of three characters that are in the church. Number one, a jailer, right? a Roman guard, who is a little intense to the point where when he fails his mission, he's about to cough himself, right? Hey, hey, what are you going to do? None! Like, that's, that's intense, right? Then we have a young a young woman that we know about who was possessed by a demon. Oh, I can see we're about to have a pot of jumbo here in one big group. You know, we got a couple volatile people right here. And then we have a lady who is a businessman, a businesswoman, a very successful businesswoman. There's the only things we know about these three individuals. You can just imagine, as, as, as people came to Christ, more and more, um, this pot of gumbo, like, it was just all mixed up together with a bunch of different people. But here's the beauty. What they had was something that was greater than what was different from them. They were in Christ. And I love this. He says, I pray and I am thankful that we have this spiritual community. This communion created by God, if you would. Not communion based on the fact that you like the lions and I like the lions, or that you like food and I like food, or that you like sports and I like sports. No, communion that is not built on common interest. It's actually created by the moment when the Holy Spirit indwelt me and He indwelt you. And now we have this common unity. We have this fellowship. We have partnership in the gospel. I love this posture. 
Oh, if we could be in our posture of prayer for others, first and foremost, thankful that we share the name of Christ. Before we begin to tell God all the things about them that irritate us and all the things that we wish He would change in them, right? Anybody? I'm really good at that prayer. I'm really good at telling God ways He should fix you. I mean, I don't tell Him about me because, I mean, it's obvious, right? I don't have any issues. That's a joke. But he says, this is my posture. I think about it. And just, just bear with me. Let me build this and then let me, let me get an offering that before we jump into the what. But it was this communion that they shared that Paul focused on. And he prayed for them instead of focusing on their differences or their disagreements, which he's going to get to. He focused on this community created by God, this spiritual fellowship, this partnership in the gospel. That caused them to be filled with thankfulness for that. I just wonder what would change in my prayer life is if, if when I went to pray for someone, the first thing I did was find a way to thank God for them. Thank God that we're one in Christ. To acknowledge that we're not enemies, we're not different. We're one. We have this common unity in Christ. Now we have some differences, right? So that's the first posture. The second posture is confidence. He says, I'm thankful. I thank God every time I remember all of you and all my prayers for all of you. But the second aspect of his posture in prayer that we see here is in verse 6 is confidence. When he prays, look what he says. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. All right, can I get a moment of honesty here? Sometimes I pray for people, and I really don't have much confidence that they're ever going to get it. Anybody? Like, there's just some, some honesty here for a second. I know I'm not the only train wreck in this room. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. What happens when a train crashes? We all look. We love it. Boom, right? Anyway, that was a bad joke. That's just a good I don't always have confidence. I often pray for people frustrated, wondering if they're ever going to get it. Paul says, here's how I posture myself in prayer. I love this. I am confident of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I was reading a book this summer um, called Soul Talk by Larry Crabb. And he talks about this process when you're dealing with someone that you need to think, he calls it think vision. Before you pour into someone's life, before you interact with someone or even give them advice, you have to take a step back and think vision. What would this person's life look like if they truly lived, fully submitted and surrendered to Jesus Christ? And you have to acknowledge that that could happen because that's what God wants. And I was so convicted, y'all. I was so convicted that usually I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking about whatever is going on in this person's life that has brought them into my into an encounter with me, right? And if I can just get them to fix this, then they can go away. This is how we work. So like, that's how I work. I think it probably is. I mean, we pray like, oh, Lord, I prayed for Joe for 40 years. He ain't never going to get it. Instead of praying with confidence, God, you are the one who is sovereign over salvation. You are the one who is sovereign over sanctification. You are the one who can take a dead heart and bring it to life. You are the one who can take a hard heart and make it soft. That's what he's done for us. Amen. Because I pray with confidence. Compassion. So his posture is thankfulness, confidence, compassion. We're going seven and eight. I love this. Right for me to feel this way about all of you. If I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending into the church and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. And here's what I love. God can testify. 
translation to modern vernacular. I swear to God that this is true. I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. When he prays, he brings Lazarus himself in the posture of thankfulness. He postures himself in the posture of confidence. And this is the one we can't miss, the posture of compassion. He was filled with love for the people he was praying for. So much so that he could tell them that God himself would testify to the fact that he loves them the same way he does. Wow. That, that's, convict, that's convicting to me, y'all. Here's the posture. This is what he's saying. I thank my God every time I remember you and all of my prayers for you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Thankful. Confident of this, that you began to work and you were carried on to completion. And God is my witness. I love you. Now let's just pull back for a second. Before we talk about what we're going to pray. I don't know about you, but that's how I want to enter prayer. That's not usually how I enter prayer, is it? I'm usually not thankful. I'm usually more frustrated with whatever's going on, so that's what drives me to God's presence. I usually am like, man, Lord, this person's never going to get it. You're going to have to wake Joe up. If you're Joe, I'm sorry, but that's just the name I'm choosing today. And then if I'm, if I'm honest... I don't spend a lot of time praying that God would help me love people the way I should. But I think what I see here, and this is why I, I, I want to pause this for a second. I think the reason the Apostle Paul had one of those prayer lives, and most of us would say, man, that's the prayer life that I want. And I think the reason that, that I struggle, that, that, that maybe you struggle to have the prayer life we want, isn't necessarily we don't know how to say the right thing. It, it boils down to this. The three-step plan to get my heart in check before I pray for anyone. Am I thankful for them? Am I confident? Have I thought vision? Do I see this person and what it would look like? What it would look like for this young dad to surrender his life to Christ and live in complete, complete obedience and everything he can to love his wife and his kids? And do I love this guy? Like, is, 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 is it the greatest desire of my heart to be good? I think if we would slow down, it might change. I'm going to tell you, um, the Lord took me to the test. So this is the thing about, about preaching. I love it and I hate it. So I built me to do it. I, I, I'm not trying to run from that anymore like I used to. But some days I'm like, can, can, can I have a break? Can I have a week off? So all week I was, I was trying to focus on this posture. And you know what God did on Friday night? He made me run into somebody who has made it clear they don't really like me. And I'm struggling to not treat them as the same. Anybody? You have people like that in your life? I woke up Saturday morning and the Holy Spirit was like, pray for this person. No! No! Oh, okay, Lord, I can pray for this person. Change them because they're jacked up. I'm like, this is the posture of my heart, right? I had all sorts of time to be with the Lord because the ladies in the house are my glow bowling, so they sit out late, so everybody's sleeping in. So, it's, you know, those mornings where you're like, oh, I just wish somebody would wake up so I could find something else I should be doing instead of submitting to the Lord right now? You know, I walked through this. And I said, I should myself in thankfulness for this person and the fact that they know Christ. I began to think vision and, and, and ask God to help me believe that He was working in their life and He could work through them. And I begged Him to help me love this person like Christ loves this person. And you know what the host said? What am I saying? Nope. So I did. Then they invited me over for dinner. I'm like, look. I'm looking to the test, right? 
know, it changes everything. So before we even talk about what we should be saying, I just want to encourage us. I think the key to the joyful living in the midst of uncertainty is that when we when we practice this indispensable practice, this communion with God that, that Christians need for life, part of our struggle might not be what we're saying. It might just be how we posture ourselves. And if we could posture ourselves more like Paul and thank God for the partnership we have with this person, if we could be confident that God is doing something in their life. Oh, man. Can you imagine where you'd be without God? Can you imagine what would happen if my grandma... My grandma and my grandpa... Uncle Ted would get down on the knees every day by the Gavin Court, which is just old people's couch, right? With plastic on it, and you can't put your feet on it or you go to hell. So that's what a Gavin Court is. But it took me forever to figure that out. But anyway, they would get down every night and they would pray. And they'd pray for the three wrecks. Train wrecks. I'm just going to include my brother in this too because he ain't no angel. Train wrecks and grandchildren. One day. So if one day they would have been like, I never even get it. Now we're perfect. Our wives, we remind our wives all the time they should be thankful. So there's the posture. All right, let's move forward because I, I, I want to. I'm not going to spend as much time next year on the content of Paul's prayer because I think. It's just the natural outflow when we come with the right posture. And then I'm actually going to give us an exercise in church today. I know. We have to do something. Yeah. The content of this prayer. Let's look at verses 9, 10, and 11. Once he postures himself in the right way, what does he actually pray? Fix the three things. Number one, for their knowledge and love, for knowledge of and love for God. Look at, let's just read together. Hopefully you're, you've been memorizing it. If not, you can get started on it. This is my prayer, he says, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That you may be pure and blameless. Excuse me, that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless at the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is good. So it's simple. Three things. Number one, you pray for their knowledge of and love for God. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Knowledge of what? He says, I want your love to abound. But what is the knowledge that grows our love? It's not knowledge of intellect. It's the knowledge of who our dad is. Right? That's what he's referring to here. The knowledge of God that should lead to a more loving response. So he wants them to know God and in turn grow in their love for him. By the way, if you ever wonder, man, does God want me to pray this for this person? The answer is always yes. God longs that everybody would come to know him. And by the way, it may seem elementary to you, but this is why in the Abide Journal, the two questions we ask every day and are trying to structure all our community groups to discuss is, what do I learn about who my dad is, and what does that mean for me today as his child? Because our knowledge of God is what will change us. So yes, it's good to read scripture. It's good to study scripture. I'm super happy when like people are like, hey, I know what this Greek word means, and I did this whole word study. Great. Did you see who your dad was? And did that cause you to want to be more like him today? Because that's what I want, right? People are always shocked. And they're like, hey, what does this mean in the reading today? And I'm like, I don't know. I didn't look it up. You didn't look it up? What do we pay you for? Are you supposed to know everything? Uh, actually, I, I couldn't get past the fact that, my God, is a God of grace. So I just looked at him and told him he's amazing. I don't know what that means. I'm okay with that. You know, the time, right? So he prays for their knowledge and love of God. And if he prays for their understanding for living, you can write down moral discernment. He says here, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. 
discern what is best. What he's talking about is their understanding for living to discern what is best. Listen, y'all, we have thousands of options in front of us every day. Right? Oh, that we would pray for each other, that we can just discern what is best, what God is doing, what God is calling us to know. Obviously, there's some pretty clear commands in Scripture, but there's a lot of areas that Scripture doesn't address that we are left to rely on the Holy Spirit speaking to us to know the right thing to do. Right? So he prays for their understanding for living, and then he prays for their character. But they may be pure and blameless at the day of Christ, for the day of Christ, excuse me, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. He prays for their character. He prays that this, if they know and love God, and if they're being led into what is best by Holy Spirit, then I know it's going to produce fruit in their life. So he prays for the fruit in their life. The question comes up, what is the fruit of righteousness? that comes through Jesus Christ, it is the evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. There is fruit if you're following Christ that should come. Okay? Now, this, this is not, I'm not going to go like, no one needs to like, feel like they're a lesser Christian, but here's the reality. If you know Christ, fruit should be coming in your life. And if it's not, it's something that we, we, we need to talk about. We need to help. But we're here to help. We're here to walk. Right? And let's be honest. Like, sometimes we just have bad fruit. The devil tried really hard in my house yesterday morning. I got angry. I responded poorly. And then I had to be the one to say, yeah. Dang it. Do it again. I will not kick any more animals today. I didn't kick one yesterday. Some of you are like, oh. Some of you, I, t- I know you love your dogs a lot. I don't. But anyway. My dogs are there for the children, and then I have children who keep bringing dogs in and leaving, but leaving their dogs. Right? Anybody? Anybody know this thing? Just thankful. Praise God they did not bring cats in and then leave. But, ooh. All right. Moving on. Moving on. Let's, let's finish this up. What is the fruit of righteousness? Well, I think the simple source is Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. We should be begging God for those fruits to be in present in people's lives. You know what's not a fruit of the Spirit? Well, income. This one might bug you. Health. Like, I think we should be praying for people's health. I want, I want people to be well, but if, if you are one of those individuals who's struggling with health, it, it doesn't mean that like, you're, somehow you're a secondary Christian, you're not doing something right. It may just mean that God is allowing you to rejoice from suffering and bring Him glory in a way that people who aren't walking through that couldn't. We get it so twisted. Like, we pray for people's jobs to go well and for their 401ks to be full and for their investments to come through and we're not praying for the fruit of righteousness. I'd rather be broke at the end of my life and holy than to be unholy and have everything in the world. Right? And there's still a little part of that says, but can I get that both? Anybody? Anybody? Or can I just be really holy and rich? And he's like, no, in your life, Kevin, I'm just going to be honest to me. So it was like, in your life, those two things kind of contradict each other. Every time you have money, you're like, look at me. And then we see the goals of prayer. Don't miss this at the end. This is for the glory and the praise of God. Friends, we're, we're, we're really praying for the glory and the praise of God. You could say it like this. Paul's prayer, the contents of his prayer, was this. For the Philippians' total sanctification for the glory of God. So once I've postured myself in thankfulness and confidence and compassion, how do I pray for someone? I pray for their total sanctification for the glory of God. That they would know and love God. That they would know how to walk in what is best in this world. And that they would manifest the fruit of life. Alright. Ooh, baby. I'm done early. 
you do that, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, we're not completely done yet, though. But, uh... Let me make a couple action steps. Number one. Just things like this are hard for me. Because you guys know my heart is for lost people. And I love you guys. Yes, that's why I am a pastor. But I love lost people. And I want to see people come to know Christ. And so... It's very easy to walk away from a sermon like this just saying, oh, I don't even know Jesus. I'm not going to pray like that. And so here's our first action step. Surrender your life to the one who wants to begin and bring to completion his good work in you. We do not believe that anyone is outside of the grace of God here at this. Don't care what you've done. Don't care what you're thinking about doing. We believe in a God who is sovereign over salvation, who is sovereign over the circumstances of your life, and He has sent His Son to die on the cross in your place and be raised to life so you can live in His. And this is where it starts. If you don't know Christ, praying is probably pointless. It starts with a relationship with Him. And He brings you into His family. And I never want to miss a chance just to say that wherever you're at in that journey, we want to walk with you through that. If you don't know Christ, we don't think you're the enemy, but we'd love to introduce you to our children. Those in this room say, I know Jesus. Then here's the action step. One that's a little harder, one that's a little easier. Number, number two, evaluate why or why you're not praying. Like, like having these abstract action steps are so hard. Now, here's what I want you to I want you to go home today. And if, and if you're someone who's like, no, I pray every day, I want you to ask yourself, you and the Holy Spirit, why do I pray? Do I pray because I'm supposed to? Do I pray because I have this whole list of things I have to do in order to make God happy? Do I pray thankfully, confidently, and passionately for the total sanctification of my brothers and sisters for the glory of God? Because I'm going to be honest, sometimes I pray because I'm supposed to. And I want to confess that and we move past that. But if you're in this room and maybe you're like me, and on certain days you're like, I just don't pray very much, I want you to just take some time today and sit with the Lord and say, why don't I pray? And maybe it's just my posture's off. Maybe I'm not very thankful. Maybe I'm not very confident. Maybe I'm not very compassionate. Like, this is the beautiful thing about the life in the kingdom. It is as simple as just telling God, this is what's going on and I need your help. And we make it so hard. 17,000 steps. No! Dad, I'm struggling. This is what's in me. Would you fix it? Man, it's that simple. And once you've done that, and that leads back to step number three, just pray for Philippians 1, 9 through 11 for your brothers and sisters in Christ this week. Now, here, do not like to try to pray for every single person in this room this week. All right? I know some of you are like, oh, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna go get the whole directory of people on my phone. I'm going to pray for everybody. Like, that's awesome if you get through it. But, like, just start with your family. And then go to people you have relationships with, maybe your community group, maybe people you serve with, right? And, and then, and then if you're like, oh, I still have plenty of time, then maybe expand out. But, like, just begin to pray for the people that God puts on your heart. Pray for their total sanctification of the glory of God. And make sure we posture ourselves appropriately. So here's what we're going to do. I'm actually going to give us a couple minutes. Because I think one of the biggest tragedies that happens in our consumeristic, time-driven mentality of church is we come here to take in something, wrote down a few notes, now we may or may not stick around for deep training, and then by the time we get home, we're going to have forgotten everything, right? Because guess what's wrong? Oh, you going to have some Actually, I don't usually get past lunch. I'm usually thinking about lunch as soon as I get out of the service. I'm like, ooh, I wonder what my wife's going to make today. It's always good. That's why I'm large. But I want you to take a moment right now. And if you're in that spot where it's your posture that's struggling, I just want to encourage you to ask God to fix it. And here's, here's something that might be a little crazy. If you, like, I don't really know how to say that, but I'm going to ask you to do something even crazier. Think of the person next to you and say, will you just pray? my posture and 
And if they don't know, then what they need to do is go to the next person. Will you pray for this guy's pastor and pray? And my siblings. Like, just, you, you'll find somebody, all right? I'm serious. Like, we, we were like, oh, man, that, that's too much. That was not. Maybe you're like, no, I love this. I love this. This, this is good. This is my posture. This is what I want to pray for people. And maybe I, I've been praying that God will put someone on your heart that you can begin to pray for a total sense of We're going to take a minute, two minutes, three, we're going to take however long I want. And we're just going to pray. All right? And after that, I want us to sing that song we sang right before. Speak the name of Jesus, baby. The God of Consequence. Let's pray that, and then we will wrap up. So go ahead and take a few minutes. Pray. If you need someone to pray for you, just lean over to the person next to you and say, You pray for me.